بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله وأصحابه الذين اجتبى أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات سيجعل لهم الرحمن ودا فإنما يسرناه بلسانك لتبشر به المتقين وتنذر به قوما لدا وكم أهلكنا قبلهم قرن هل تحس منهم من أحد هل تحس منهم من أحد أو تسمع لهم ركزا صدق الله العظيم today إن شاء الله we'll be talking about the last of al عشرة المبشرة the tenth of Al Asharatul Mubashara. Those ten Sahaba Ridwanullahi Alayhi Majma'in who got the glad tiding of Jannah from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And once again, just as I reminded at the beginning, I would like to remind at the end of it also that these Al Asharatul Mubashara are not the only Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'een who got the glad tiding of Jannah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many more Sahaba and Sahabiyyat who got this but the special thing about these Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhim ajma'een is that these ten Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een got it in one gathering and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after giving them this glad tiding of Jannah in that gathering then he dealt with them in such a special way that people realized that these are a higher rank of Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'een according to their taqwa and their iman. Of course, it was because of their ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their service to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the tawfiq to achieve those high ranks. And that would be considered the second category among the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majma'in, the first category and the highest is of al Khulafa al Rashidun. And the second number is of Al-Asharatul Mubashara. And as inshallah we'll talk about more of those Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jma'een. You would find different Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa jma'een between men and women, Sahaba and Sahabiyyat, who got the glad tiding of Jannah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on different occasions. And some of them have some very unique qualities some of them have done some unique service to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved it so much that he approved their deeds and in fact Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to inform them that from now on they won't have to worry about none of the things they would do in their life that simply means Allah would guide them so much 
that they would be never afraid of being misguided by shaitan. In other words, Allah is guaranteeing them the hidayah, that hidayah will never be taken out of your heart. Hidayah is one of the most important thing and is such a difficult thing to keep up with. Just as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained it beautifully, and who, who can explain it better than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who knew the details of, uh, details of all of these things, the way he put it was, إِنَّ قُلُوبَ بَنِي آدَمَ بَيْنَ إِصْبَعَيْنِ مِنْ أَصَابِعِ الرَّحْمَانِ يُقَلِّبُهَا كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ This is how he put it. That hearts of human beings are between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a way of explaining. يُقَلِّبُهَا كَيْفَ يَشَاءُ He turns them over the way he likes. A person does something that Allah does not approve of it. And... It's such a deed that Allah totally dislikes it, the heart will just turn over. So it's just like holding a piece of paper in your hand, how easy, how difficult it is to turn it over. In other words, turning it upside down. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, similarly, Hidayah is just that way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he's not pleased with certain deeds, and a person will continue with those type of things, Allah can turn over the hearts the other way around when I ask Allah. And this is why one of the most important things to ask and Islam teaches us to keep on asking for it every day in five times a day at least is إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاقَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ May Allah guide us to the straight path. And then it's such a critical thing that the most beloved person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is so much loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he wanted to give him a special gift he did not send it with Jibreel alayhi salatu was salam. In fact, ask Jibreel to take him up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he can give him the gift of the salah. Special mercy. But when it comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam willing to see his uncle Abu Talib taking the shahada, accepting the hidayah, and tries his best, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and continuously begging him that please just say one word, I take I will take care of the rest. And the ayah is revealed. You do not guide whom you love whom you love and you like, Allah guides whomever he likes. With all of this, subhanAllah, you can see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes to keep one rule very clear and that is Allah is Allah and Messenger is a Messenger. Keeping a distinction there. That Messenger cannot be Allah. No matter how beloved the person is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has his limitations. And no one can transgress those limits and go beyond those limits. Allah has set some limits. That no one other than Allah can do certain things and those are only for him to do. And he keeps clear distinction. Sometime the whole nation will go to a prophet, please show us this miracle. And he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah says, no, I'm not going to show it. I won't show this type of miracle. If they ask for a specific miracle, I'm not going to show them that one. He has all the power to do it. But he says, no, I won't. And sometimes, he will make things happen on the hands of those that are considered on the second number, which means they are not considered to be the highest in rank. They would perform something higher than those who are above them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would show that you, the human beings, don't do it. I'm the one who do it. And I choose 
who would be selected for doing it? Take a simple example. We all know Sayyidina Yaqub والسلام, of course, being such a great prophet of Allah. We all know that every human being and especially Anbiya والسلام, like the cleanliness. And Anbiya والسلام, are the most clean people in the world. So Yaqub والسلام, of course is washing his face every day. His hands are touching his face and his eyes. But he's not getting the eyesight back. And here his son, Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, sends his shirt. And as soon as Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam gets the shirt and put it in his, in his face, he gets the eyesight back. So he's getting the eyesight back from the shirt of his son. But he is always wiping his face and his, his own dress is touching his face. His hands are touching his eyes, but he's not getting the eyesight back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing his power. And he showed. We all have heard about Bay'atul Ridwan. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed that Usman radiallahu anhu have been murdered, he sent him to Makkah Mukarramah to discuss the treaty and the conditions of the treaty with the kuffar of Quraysh. And someone spread the rumor that Usman radiallahu anhu is murdered and they killed him. So he took that bay'ah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the bay'ah on doing jihad then against those people who murdered Usman radiallahu anhu. And later on they find out that the news was wrong. On another occasion, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is sitting in Makkah Mukarramah. And the kuffar of Quraysh are surrounding Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they're asking him about how Baytul Maqdis looks like, how many pillars, how many windows, how many doors, and he's giving them all of those details. Allah makes him see all of those things. While sitting in Makkah, he sees everything in Baytul Maqdis, but sitting in Makkah, he's not informing him of Usman radiallahu anhu at that time yet. He shows his power. And Allah likes to show his power also. So that we can keep a clear distinction between Allah and the Messenger of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, this hidayah is one of the most important things. And it's one of the most difficult things to keep up with it all the time. And here we are talking about a person today. His father, Zayd bin Amr bin Nufayt was known from the time of Jahiliyyah of being a Muwahid. Muwahid means a person who never associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Sa'id bin Amr, during the days of Jahiliyyah, he realized that all of this idol worshipping means nothing. We make them with our own hands and then we start worshipping them. Of course, it doesn't make no sense. So he traveled and traveled for as far as he could in search of the right deen. He himself explains in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, I went to Jews and I went to many different rabbis of Jewish religion asking them about their religion and trying to find out more and more about it. He said, finally I found a, a man, a rabbi, who was very sincere very learned, I asked him if I can stay with him and then practice Judaism with him. He said, most welcome and nothing wrong. This is the deen of Allah. You can practice it. But all I can tell you that is you should be aware if you accept this religion, you'll get your share of Allah's anger. If you want to accept it, go ahead you will get your share of Allah's anger. He says, this is what I'm running away from. I want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want no share of his anger. Then he started searching for more. And he went to many Christian priests. And he said, one of them also, when I found the person who, was, who I considered the most suitable person, and very learned, and practicing of his religion, 
I asked him if I can stay with him. He told me the same thing. He said, sure, you are welcome to accept our religion. But if you become a Christian, you should be aware that you will get your share of Allah's wrath and Allah's curse. The hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari used the word la'na. That you will get your share of Allah's curse. He said, I can't afford to do that. Then what should I do? He said, the only thing is, follow the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Because his religion is pure and whoever would follow that way of life will never get anything from Allah's anger, Allah's right or Allah's curse. So he said, how can I practice that religion? He said, I'm not aware of the exact ways of the practices of that religion. All I can tell you is that in Makkah, and he was from Makkah also, soon a prophet will be coming out who would be following the same steps and he would teach you how to follow them. So Zayd bin Amr, as he came back to Makkah Mukarramah, he used to go and sit by the Kaaba and raise his hands and say, Ya Allah, I make you witness, bear my witness, that I am following the deen of Ibrahim. I don't know how to follow it. I did not find any other way of life that will make me, that will allow me to please you without having any share of your anger. So Ya Allah, just accept me the way it is. And he was waiting for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But of course, Allah's ways are different. Allah's planning was different for him. He passed away five years before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the Prophet. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the family and his own son. Who always heard that thing from his father. As soon as he heard about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came and embraced Islam. His name was Sa'id. And finally he became one of Al-Ashratul Mubashirah. One of the ten people who got the glad tidings of Jannah. Sa'id bin Amr bin Nufayl. But as far as his father, Sa'id says, I went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I asked him, Ya Rasulullah, my father never did any shirk even during the days of Jahiliyyah. Where do you think my father is? Is he saved? Can I pray for him? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sa'id, I have seen your father in white dress. That simply means his Jannah, his in Jannah. Because he always tried his best to follow that deen, but he didn't know how to. And of course, Allah is not going to punish a person who tried his best following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sa'id bin Zayd, as we said, he's out of Aishratul Mubashara, and he's the cousin of Umar bin al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu and his brother-in-law also. And he was the cause, him and his wife, which means the sister of Umar radiyallahu anhu, who became the cause for Umar radiyallahu anhu to come into Islam. We all know that Umar radiyallahu anhu was going to kill Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa billah. On his way, he found someone, a person with the name Nu'aym. Nu'aym asked him, where are you going? And Nu'aym was Muslim. He asked him, where are you going? He said, I'm going to kill that person who claims to be a prophet. He has divided our communities badly. They said, why would you like to go and meet, uh, you know, hurt that person, whereas your own relatives, your own sister and your brother-in-law are following him and they believe in him. You better go and deal with your family member first before you go and talk to someone else. So he went to their home and then finally that became the cause for Umar radiallahu anhu to embrace Islam. Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu anhu was one of the other sahab, one of the sahaba radiallahu alayhi wa who was mustajab al he would just raise the hand and make the dua and Allah would accept it. He was known for two things. Number one, his humbleness. Such a humble person that people would be always after him. Tell, tell us something about you. You spent so much time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You got the glad tidings of Jannah. Tell us something about you. About yourself, about your ibadah. And he would always try to hide himself, cover up, and would never mention anything about himself. Therefore, when we open the books of history, you won't find nothing 
in detail about the ibadah and about how he was spending his day-to-day -day life. He even prevented his wife uh, to mention his lifestyle at home meant from mentioning it to people because all she would mention was that he does so much that I don't know if any of you can afford it. Therefore, he tells me not to mention it to anyone. So one thing he was known for, humbleness. And the second thing he was known for, the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everyone knows if you would like to see Sa'id before Zuhr, no one can talk to him. He would be performing salah. Which simply means because the time from sunrise till Zuhr is a time, is there is no makruh time for salah. Between Asr and Maghrib, then you can do nawafil. So from after sunrise till Zuhr, everyone knew that Sa'id will be just standing and doing the nawafil. He was known for his salah, for his fasting, for the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But one of the things that we learn, very important thing that we learn from the life of Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu anhu is how parents affect the children and how important it is to make sure that we do the righteous things in order to keep our children on the right track. Normally what happens is we like to do everything, but our, we like our children to be the perfect Muslims. We would be committing every haram. We would be earning haram. We would be eating haram. We would like our children to do everything that is right. And according to the deen of Allah, it doesn't happen. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have mentioned in the hadith, when a father, when a person does something wrong, it affects his generation up to three generations. It would affect his children, his grandchildren, and his children's grandchildren. The effect of one person's evil goes up to three generations. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is informing us. Whether it's good or bad, the effect is there. Sometime a question comes to our mind and many people, uh, people ask questions. Why people have to, other people have to suffer for what one person is doing? Remember, in this life, everything has some effect. And when a person uses something, although it might be only one person doing it, but affects everyone else in the house also, if one person in the house will put on a fire in the house, we are not going to say the fire should burn only his room or his bedroom and should not affect the other people in the house. This is the rule of the life. It affects others also. Whatever one person does in the house, you open the gas at your home. It's going to affect everyone else in the house. Same thing. These sins or good deeds, they all have their own effects. And as soon as a person will open up the door towards haram in the house, it's not only him, everyone else will be affected also in the house. Sa'id bin Zayd radiallahu anhu, one of the ways he achieved that high status of Al-Ashrat al mubashara is through the worship of his father, who even during the days of Jahiliyyah always was searching for truth. And that is what made Sa'id. Without anyone inviting to Islam, no one had to go and knock at Sa'id's door. As soon as he heard that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is inviting people to the deen of Allah, he himself went and knocked at the door. Ya Rasulullah, I'm ready to take the shahada. This was the effect of his father's deeds on Sa'id's life. And we see the effect of our deeds on our children's life. And then we have to, I don't say what complains and what not, but at least we have to realize that before we look at anything else and before we start blaming even our own children, we look start reviving our lives and look into our lives, make sure that is not an effect of our children. One of the scholars used to say that when I ride my horse, when I ride my horse, through my horse behavior, I can find out if I have disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The day that horse does not obey me, I know that something, I have done something wrong today. And this is why even the horse doesn't want to obey me today. One of the scholars of Islam, he was sitting in the group of students. And one day, I mean, they were very respectful to him and they would now, never make any noise in his presence. As it is, of course, the way 
that they learned from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Sahaba how to respect. So, in his old age, one day he's sitting with his students, and two of his students started arguing with each other in his presence. So, a newcomer over there, he asked, he said, "How come you people, you, you have your students don't respect you? In your presence, they are making all of this noise. They have no respect for you." So he pointed towards his knees. He said, I don't know what you mean. All I'm asking you is, how come you don't have the respect that the scholars normally deserve? So he again pointed towards his knees. I don't know what you mean. He says, I have a knee problem because of which I cannot perform nawafil anymore that I used to do it before. And this is the effect of that. This is the effect of me stopping doing the nawafil that I used to do before. I cannot perform the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's missing from my life and you can see the effect of it in my life. All of these things have their own effects. And they have effect on our family members and our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us tawfiq to learn our lessons from Sahaba Rizwanullahi alayhi wa ta'ala and follow the straight path of Salat al-Mustaqeem. Mawla ya salli wa sallim dhani